The other thing that we did recently at our um, Astronomy Society in uh, in Victoria was to have a star party last weekend, and uh, it was a very successful event all round. It was mainly for optical astronomy, but we also had a radio astronomy demonstration and loads of new members in our club now. Every star party that we have, which is every few months really, um, we seem to have another wave of new members join, new people interested in radio astronomy. So there's always something to to explain our story to a new bunch of visitors, and they're often very interested. And some of them so in, get so interested they join our particular group and start working on some of our projects, which is terrific. It's good to have that team of people dedicated to radio astronomy start to expand. Um, so. We tried to set up a demonstration of neutral hydrogen reception using a, a small horn antenna that we've got because our, our dish, 8.5 meter dish, is still in a bit of mechanical repair. You may know that we wore out that worm drive. Um, so that still hasn't been reassembled. So we had a little horn antenna and that uses this other radio astronomy supplies um, device called a 1420 megahertz continuum frequency converter. So you might be familiar with this product. We purchased that years ago as, along with our other neutral hydrogen receiver. I'd never worked with this particular box before. I had done some work with the low noise amplifier, which is shown there on the right. That was part of that package. This device converts the neutral hydrogen frequency down to 10 megahertz. And it didn't work. Our demonstration on the star party didn't work. It failed. It let us down. So I thought, well, I better take it home and do some servicing and find out what went wrong. And uh, so I started to experiment with this and measure a few things. Uh, and obviously, it's um, it's got a, a front end board and another little circuit board. Uh, no documentation was provided with this, no circuit diagrams or technical descriptions. So I, was, I, I decided to sort of reverse engineer it. And uh, because there's a nice cable there, I could connect it and adapt it to it and measure each of these modules on their own, which I did. And also noted this, that the output was labeled at 10.7 megahertz, which we were trying to use in our demonstration, of course. And uh, so I started, started measuring things to see what could be possibly wrong with this whole assembly. Uh, I've got a good quality signal generator and that same spectrum analyzer you saw earlier. So I set it up to do this gain measurement to see if there was a loss of performance of this sensitivity of this receiver and my conclusion was the overall gain 1420 megahertz down to 10.7 was only 36 db and that's well below what the specification is as printed on the box which is 55 db so there's the first clue that there was something faulty the front end section however just this this module on the right hand side on its own which delivers an output of 70 megahertz that gain of that amplifier was 59 dB, which is quite acceptable. Um, I also just determined that the output of the overall assembly was not 10.7 megahertz. It's actually with the, an accurate frequency going in, you were getting 10.017. So I'm not sure why the product was labeled as a 10.7 megahertz output. It's obviously it's a six megahertz bandwidth, but it doesn't really deliver 10.7 out it delivers 10.0 with a bit of an error on that and uh, that's not really relevant if you're using a wideband software to find radio to look at that signal but if you wanted to do doppler shift measurements i think it's a misleading label to be honest um, i have to admit admit that what else can i say so i concluded that with that fairly high level of signal coming out of the the first stage the um, 70 megahertz converter it must, have, must be something faulty with this 70 to 10 megahertz converter. And so I pulled the board apart and had a look on the other side, the component side. And I found it was quite a sophisticated looking design. Um, I looked up these block, block items and found out what they were. Uh, the two larger ones are mini circuit filters, low pass filters. And this smaller one is a, uh, a Macom product, a, a, a wide band mixer. So I did a bit of reverse engineering of the circuit diagram and I drew just the signal path on its own. Obviously there's going to be a, an oscillator in there, local oscillator for this mixer to convert down to 10 megahertz. Um, I drew the circuit diagram 
out of this particular circuit, but I didn't have all the component values. So it just looks like an oscillator. The other thing uh, that you can find if you turn the other the board over the other way in the in the other photograph, you can see that here. So there is actually a quartz crystal sitting on the top side of the board and it's stamped with the frequency 60.0 megahertz. So it's not a 10.7 megahertz down converter, it's a 10 megahertz down converter. All right, so let me find out. Uh, as I've worked with this particular item, I set it up looking at it as an item on its own, 70 megahertz going in, 10 megahertz coming out. And I started poking around physically, scratching it with a plastic um, adjusting tool on the components to see if there was any intermittence. And sure enough, I started to see a point where the output of, of the signal on the spectrum analyzer was going up and down by about 10 dB. And this area of the circuit board was very sensitive around that output socket. So what does it tell me? I realized, okay, I've seen this before. I've seen this before, fellas or folks, um, boys and girls. Uh, and I've seen it in a similar construction where a coupling capacitor connected very close to a circuit board mounted SMA connector, the capacitor fails. So I guess that's the message I'm trying to um, send today, that uh, that's not necessarily a good strategy. There could be temperature coefficient differences in there. This particular socket goes onto an aluminium chassis and there's a nut that locks that circuit board to the chassis. There could be differential stresses on that connection that translate back to a, a stress on the capacitor, breaks it, snaps it, and it goes open circuit. So there's some sort of residual coupling that still makes the thing work, but uh, typically 20 dB down in gain. So I replaced it with a, um, a discrete capacitor with wires and uh, that can have some level of flexibility then and you won't necessarily have it fail. The other way to get rid of that problem is to have a cable connecting to the chassis connector rather than put mechanical stress on the circuit board itself. All right, so um, the other thing I determined was that this converter, 70 megahertz down to 10 megahertz, is actually a conversion loss. So you do get loss in that configuration. There's a deliberate 3 dB pad in there. Um, the loss of the low pass filter is not too bad, about half, half a dB, but the mixer has a conversion loss of at least 6 dB. So that's, uh, mathematically, it should have been no more than about nine and a half dB loss. But uh, in fact, when it was faulty, it was 22 dB. But when I replaced that capacitor, I, I got it down to, 12 and a half dB loss. So that's still loss. That's still RF we're throwing away. So I've made a recommendation to the uh, the team that when we use this particular unit as a demonstration, we actually remove that converter and we convert directly from, um, I'll, I'll talk about this low noise amplifier in a sec. We convert directly from the 1420 megahertz neutral hydrogen down to 70 megahertz. And we then use that because it's quite a good gain. We don't throw away signal. And we can still do research work and demonstrations at the 70 megahertz level. There's no problem with that. So I've ordered a, a chassis connector that will give us an N-type connection. And it can then go directly to the 70 megahertz output of the um, that front end module, because that front end module has a cable. So instead of connecting into the down converter, we'll just have another socket here and we'll have a 70 megahertz output and that'll be quite acceptable for our purposes. So the other part of this package was this low noise amplifier and very similar to the one that uh, I mentioned, re reported on earlier, um, just before. So that was another module that was worth measuring in the same manner, its gain and its noise figure. So that's what I did as the other exercise in this report. Um, this time I didn't do a hundred sweeps, I did 70 sweeps, a couple of slight differences in the settings, but the end result was still comparable to what we were expecting. Um, the noise power that I measured was minus 141.4 dBm. The gain of the amplifier, 32.17. That fixed constant again based on room temperature. So I measured 0.43 dB and the actual specification stamped on that module that we purchased was 0.34. So we're in the right ballpark. It's a, a very good low noise amplifier. Very pleased with that result. And that'll certainly be 
um, quite suitable for our use at star parties and other experiments we might want to try. Because we do have this horn, we can rotate it around. It's a wide beam width, of course, and I still think it'll, it'll deliver some useful results for us. All right, that's enough from me, Rich. Thank you. Well, thanks. Now, that's a Spectre Cyber you just uh, disassembled, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. I've got one on my desk, so, uh, yeah, that's good. Well, watch out for those have... little coupling capacitors. I think that's a risky, risky design in mechanics. And it's, I've seen it twice now. I've seen it twice in, in the Radio Astronomy Supplies products. I've had it fail in another module that we were working on in the same scenario. So it's just something that if we design things like that in the future, be wary of that connection with a mechanical socket next to the circuit board. 